So it's 12.30. Uh, this is week four of a four week event. Uh, this week we're looking at alternatives. Um, after a year where many alternatives perhaps uh, proved to be less alternative than uh, some investors expected, um, I'm really pleased today that we've got Stephen from Green Cape, Green Coat UK Wind, which in what was a difficult year for asset classes of all kinds, but uh, energy producers had their own challenges. Um, UK Wind turned in an outstanding net asset value performance and really importantly, in the year of very high inflation, maintained its 10 year record since launch of increasing its dividend by inflation or more. Um, with a fully covered, more than fully covered dividend. UK Wind is about five and a half billion sterling of onshore and offshore wind assets in, in the UK. And uh, we all like the uh, the easy t statistic to help you visualize what that means. That means um, providing power for about 1.8 million homes in the UK. So UK Wind is a significant energy generator, not only in the investment trust sector, but um, in the UK. Um, and indeed, its scale means that it's a shareholder in what was on commissioning uh, the largest wind asset in the world, Horn C1. Um, so with some of those eye watering statistics, um, let me hand you over to Stephen, who's going to speak for about half an hour. Do put questions into the uh, into the text box and uh, we'll try and get through some of those after Stephen's uh, finished presenting. So with that, Stephen, I'll hand over to you. Oh, thank you again. And good afternoon. And good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, you know, it's, it, it's been an interesting, uh, uh, I suppose, reflecting on uh, Monday being our 10th uh, anniversary uh, of listing. So we listed uh, 27th of May 2013 and the, the sort of thesis, I guess, in in ten years ago was that there was a need for uh, uh, wind uh, uh, in in the uh, uh, you know a, a company rather to 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 buy into operating wind um, for doing a whole range whole range of things, not just producing green power, which is obviously the big thing, um, but also uh, as uh, you know, build out was so substantial, and, and it's even more so now, I guess, even ten years later. Um, you know the need for a proper secondary market that would be uh, buying operating capacity and and just year on year on year for the life of an asset, so for thirty years of of life of an asset, um, be having very stable uh, yield, very stable uh, dividend growth, and 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 capital preservation as well. So we started that, that off ten years ago, and it will sort of just go through how that's been to some extent, and then some of the you know what the business sort of looks like. But the the, the most important things. Um, not not that we were last time we looked ninety seven in the in the in the list of FTSE companies, so not far off the FTSE one hundred. Have to get to nine to get to, to get in automatically. Um, yeah, not that we produce about one point six percent of UK electricity, um, but that we um, always pay a dividend that increases with um, RPI inflation as it has done ten times now, and always have enough to. Reinvest and, and preserve the NAV with inflation in it as well. So those are two two key components. Um, really, really important to us. That's what we've done. And you know, in, in terms of you know income uh, funds uh, or private investors or ISA investors, you know, high uh, yield income protection in with inflation, um, but also the same with capital protection as well with with inflation as well. So that's just the the thesis, if you like. And we did we do that from UK Wind Farm. So m moving sort of through. Find the right button here. Um, so this is sort of a highlight of last year, I guess. You know, three point two times covered. Wow. Um, you know, the design uh, of our business, and you'll see in a few slides, time is one point seven. So that you know speaks really of. Um, maybe we were slightly lower uh, in terms of generation last year, but it's it speaks of sort of high power price capture, and you can sort of see that um, third third point down two hundred four pounds a megawatt hour in normal times. We would expect that to be about fifty. So that's four times the time, the amount. Um, the capture discount will sort of come to um, in a few slides, slight time. So don't worry too much about that. 
Um, but the dividend of now uh, 7.72 pence, it was 6p, as you'll see in a couple of slides time in 2013, which is the RPI, incessant RPI linkage of that, uh, that, that dividend. And then I guess if you combine the dividend cover, the 2.2 extra of, of, of uh, cash generation that we had, uh, that, that then obviously gets all reinvested and uh, that equates uh, you know, to 2.2 times the dividend of about 180 million gets you to about 350. And that's what we did. We reinvested through the business up to 1.6 gigawatts of capacity. That's 1.6% of UK electricity. And then we have some commitments that are due um, that, that, that we'll, we'll fund largely from cash flow over the next few months. In that time, the last year, um, the the have increased by 34 pence. That's obviously a large amount, and that's just mostly that's banking and cash, extra cash generation from high power prices. Um, and you can sort of see since listing the the, the 69 percent versus RPI 45 percent. So you know, if if the if this, the other part of our uh, promise is not, not other than RPI links to the dividend is real nav preservation, you can see that's been beaten by 24 uh, percent in in 10 years. This is meant to be simple. It's you know we we don't have, we're not massively levered. We have 31% gearing in total everywhere. Um, most of that's at a corporate level, a bit on one of the assets, Hornsey One. Um, but that's not meant. We're not trying to hit massive return. We're just trying to deliver that very simple RPI increase of the dividend um, and 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 real net preservation, which is obviously beaten fairly fairly substantially. It's not meant to be high risk. This is just you know we we own assets for life. Um, and, and we continue to do that, and we become, you know, a significant part of the um, the, the the power system, if you like, um, but certainly the green part of it as well. So moving on, um, this is in very very simple terms how it works. So we have wind farms that produce um, uh, 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 electricity that produces cash, and then we pay out uh, a dividend in total, uh, seven hundred ninety five million pounds of dividends paid, uh, now paid actually since. Uh, uh, IPO uh, ten years ago, and then the rest we reinvest in growing the uh, growing the asset base into new new wind farms. Obviously, we've gone from six to forty five. We couldn't do that just with six hundred fifty three, but we've raised uh, uh, bought new assets with 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 um, a revolving credit facility, and then we've refinanced that in the equity markets twelve times since IPO. And so we've sort of gone around that cycle repeatedly, and then all the way on, on a per share basis. A dividend that's been increasing with RPI and, and, and real nav preservation. I think you've got that message by now, hopefully. Um, coming on then on to, uh, and not, don't worry, we're not going to go over relying on this, but just think, see, see, see things that you can see here. So the dividend, always by RPI. You can sort of see that uh, you get the dividend growth line, I guess, from RPI. So RPI, one year, dividend increase the next year, and you'll see that all the way down there, even to last year, 13.4%. And this is not our peer, our closest peer, uh, peers, I guess, have, have only ever increased by five percent. This last year's uh, RPI, as of December, uh, announced January was thirteen point four percent. So that is what the dividend has increased by this year. So it's gone from seven seventy two to eight seventy six. So it's obviously a fairly significant increase. And then you can see the very stable dividend up and cover all the way through this. So this is not meant to be up and down. This is meant to be stable. Um, design of 1.7, and there are stories all the way down here of you know big production, low production, low power pricing, high power pricing. Um, and you could get through all the years and sort of sort of see that, but it's meant to be well covered, and it obviously is. Um, carrying through this is a bit about wind production, so you can see that you know, funny enough, it's windier in the in the winters. Most of these ones where you've got very high peaks, as you can sort of see there in the best years, probably came with name named storms that you'd be able to name some. I think one of these was uh, Derek and Francis, one of these years. I think that was Derek and that was Francis, but um and, and you can sort of see the uh, uh the sort of high production, et cetera, in the winter and, and less so in the summer. But yeah, generally meant to be stable, nothing that's particularly out of the ordinary. Yes, you know, day to day, week to week, month to month can be um a lot of wind or not not a lot of wind, but over a year or over extended period, um wind is really about diligence, uh, getting the asset right, not not uh, about risk. So coming on to just a couple of things uh I want sort of to draw out of this, I guess. This is, you know, last year was an interesting year uh in terms of net asset value growth. Um we we started off with just at nearly three point one billion pounds worth of NAV and finished off at nearly three point nine. Um, we did a big investment. Um, so for the first time, we bought a, a wind farm that had project debt on it, which we've never done before. And you can sort of see the big investment and then the increase in debt is just really sort of project debt on that. Um, we, we then did a couple of other things, uh, 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 which I'll sort of go down to this bottom slide. But 
the most important thing, I guess, to sort of draw out is what, what happened in terms of valuations last year. So we have an increase of, of 384 uh, million. So that isn't about acquisitions. That's just stuff that's happened. Now, there's two things, I guess. Inflation. So inflation, as that came through, um, we, 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 we put the actual inflation for last year and the, the assumption for this year would be 8%, which I think is of average of 30 in the beginning, 3 at the end. I think it's going to be actually understated, and that probably means that now we'll go up slightly with uh, inflation coming into this year, but that added, added nearly 15 pence onto the NAV. And then discount rates, we took our discount rate uh, up, uh, really bringing the valuation down back to where we were at listing 10 years ago. Um, we believe in the capital asset pricing model, as what's happened to GILT, and, and, uh, um, and therefore you can sort of see basically offsetting each other those assumption changes. The rest then is about power pricing. So you can sort of see the 33p um, increase, that half of the at least half of those coming from our actual cash generation. Um, and you can sort of see some of that. We expected some of that. So as the DCF rolls off, the, the, the depreciation, this is investment accounting depreciation, not uh, um, normal normal depreciation, if, if you like. Um, so that's quite high. That's not the same every year. That's just because we've lost a year of what was high expect, uh, high power price expectation. But it's still 33 minus 13, 20p is quite a lot. And then the, 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 the electricity generator levy, as, as we sort of saw that we would expect to be paying for um, probably but this year and two other years, um, uh, something that we were involved intimately, I guess, with with government through from Boris Johnson through to uh, to, to, to Jeremy Hunt at the end of last year, um, being involved in that dialogue on a personal basis and working through and getting the CPI linkage of the of the of the, of the cap, et cetera, um, all, all, all something that as a significant part of the electricity system we we're absolutely involved in. That, that works effectively uh, uh, as 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 a cap at seventy five pounds uh, above seventy five pounds. Government uh, uh, it takes a, a, a forty five pound a forty five percent share, um, and and uh, we get a fifty five percent share, uh, uh, and and that carries on through um, uh, for uh, three years. Coming through then to power prices, this, this looks like quite a complicated slide. Hopefully, it's not. Um, so. We put the central case, you can sort of see top right of, of, of power prices into our model, um, uh, and we put the sort of forward curve on top of that, but we discounted a little bit because actually power prices are volatile, but also because uh, for a wind generator, um, we, we don't we don't get paid the full power price, if that makes sense. Now, what, what I mean by that is that um, the power prices in the UK work off what's called a merit order, and they're generally set by um, the gas price. So you can sort of see here on the top left, um, uh, obviously, a, a gas generator, and, and why it works effectively, the merit order works that all the nuclears on the system uh, is dispatched, all the wind and the solar on the system is dispatched, and then the, the next uh, in the merit order, the next person that comes with the system, because obviously there's competition here for, for, for capacity, uh, is the is, is the is the cheap uh, combined cycle gas turbines, then into the medium, into the high price gas uh, CCGT, and and so when you get into that area. If it, the the more wind you have, the more that you push the, the as you look at it, the more wind you have, the more you push the merit order so that uh, the price gets set by the cheap um, uh, CCGT and the less wind, the, the more it comes the other way that you get uh, priced by the uh, expensive uh, CCGT. And, and therefore, we don't manage to capture all of this. And that's what that is sort of saying effectively. The wind being an intermittent generator, the more wind the price comes down, the less wind the, the price goes up. So in total in the year, we don't capture all of it. And that's fine because we generally expect to be, um, uh, you know, we, we, we expect in the model to be getting a 20% discount to that. Actually, what we've delivered is a whole lot less than that. So hopefully it's sort of fairly conservative. But going back to the merit order, what this is effectively saying is that the price for the CGDT is it has to buy gas. So, funnily enough, is that if gas price goes up, then 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 that the, the power price goes up. They have to pay uh, for offsetting because of the carbon uh, that they produce. So you can sort of see that as well. And this effectively working off the um, European European trading system. Um, uh, and then and then there's obviously other costs, the transmission costs they have to pay for. So power price is generally set in in that sort of way. And you can sort of see that coming onto here. That's that gas price is higher than it has been, and you can that's how it works through, I guess, um, that the wind generator gets because that merit order and how the, how the power prices are set. Um, so that sort of feeds onto what we put into our model here. So this is long term assumption. We're assuming 20% discount to that because of this effect, the wind intermittency effect. 
in the short term, though, we're we're looking at this thinking, actually, power prices have been very volatile, mostly because of Ukraine. And so therefore, we've taken a much bigger um, discount than in, in, the, in the short term to do that. So this is a traded uh, power curve, but discounted by 30 percent. And, and, and what this sort of shows, I guess, this is hopefully gives you some idea of volatility again last year and how sensible we were. Um, and obviously delivered 11 at the end, but we started off looking at the expectation for last year at about 170 pounds a megawatt. We assumed um, less than that. Sorry, this is the assumption last year for what the price would be for this year. Um, we then see that's where Vladimir goes into the Ukraine. We, we then sort of get through to Q, uh, Q1 and the Q1, um, and we assume a 40% discount to that. 50% discount all the way sort of up thinking these are you know these are very big heights they're not very likely to actually happen there's a lot of volatility and risk there um you could put a high discount rate on that what we did obviously was just to put a big haircut of discount onto that and then hopefully the common sense we get to the end of the year a 30% discount would effectively weight rates to um the expected power price for this year was 170 pounds a megawatt hour which is similar to that but we're thinking actually what goes into our model is 120 and so hopefully we've been reasonably conservative. That demonstrates that through to last year. There's no point in being heroic and assuming you know, a, a much bigger amount than that, given the sort of volatility into it. But this is a key risk for us, I guess, power pricing. How do we deal with that? We get a central case from an independent consultant. We put the power price on top of it uh, that, that you could trade on, predominantly sort of priced from this, but, uh, but, be, but be conservative. That's what we've done there. And that's actually what we've delivered. So hopefully it's a very sort of sensible way of dealing with what is a significant sort of equity risk for us. We then carry on through. Hopefully I haven't confused you all by that. Happy to take any other questions on that later on. This sort of shows the NAB progression over time. Um, we then sort of carry on through to um, coming on to what's happened to the TSR. So there's a few things that's probably worth picking out for you, um, thinking about what risks are inside your portfolio. So this is, remember, Brexit. Uh, Brexit vote was here um, because we are selling power into the into the market we just sort of talked about, and and it's uh, effectively uh, gas is a dollar commodity. If if we get uh, um, uh, uh, if sterling uh, uh, devalues against the dollar, we obviously we get the same number of dollars. We get more pounds. So actually, inflation coming into the economy because of the Brexit, you can sort of see uh, investors have spotted that, and actually the TSR went up after Brexit because of that high inflation linkage. Um, High inflation linkage because we've got, uh, which is probably still talked about this earlier, costs are pretty much inflation li uh, RPI linked. Revenue um, comes from two sources. It's the most of the sort of government contract called a, re a renewable obligation certificate, which is explicitly RPI linked. So that went up by 12% last year. Um, and then power prices, which, sort of, which are um, sort of implicitly linked and actually been setting RPI largely over the last little while. So up inflation, yeah, we're pretty much immune to, and that's what you can sort of see here. You can then see coming into 18, 19, a fair bit of the sort of the or almost Greta Thunberg effect, the ESG effect, the, you know, we are um, good for the world um, as, as, as a company. We're doing good things, I guess, and people wanting to buy that type of stock. Um, and then sort of coming through to the cash generation from high power pressing on the back end of 21 through to 22. So those are sort of key three themes, I guess, for us. You know, the inflation, the the green, and 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 the exposure to 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 to, to power prices. Coming through then, um, you can sort of see how we performed against the um, was 250. So um, probably a TSR of in in the last 10 years of about 12 percent versus about 8 percent in FTSE 250. So hopefully. Um, uh, fairly, fairly so good comparison. Um, uh, then, sort of coming through some description, re really want to sort of draw a couple of things out. Um, we have, I, I think, we've had since we listed 10 years ago, somewhere in the region of 10 companies copy us, but not do so that well in one sense. Um, what we sort of show here is we've got 45 wind farms, we work out the gross asset value on each of those, add them together. Um, and then take off all the debt wherever it is, and that's what gets uh, to, our net, uh, to our net asset value. The, the discount rate is uh, for the for the business, I guess, is worked off from. Um, we have two cash flows: one which is this, this merchant cash flow, the actual exposure to the power price, but then the other is the exposure to the um, to the to the, you know, the the certificate with the, that we get for producing power, which is RPI linked. So th that discount rate is five percent. That discount rate is ten percent because they're different risks. And they ask they they ask for different periods of time. 
So the average of those is 8%. That's an unlevered, it's, it's just what comes from each of those projects. The other way of looking at it is um, the cash flow coming from the business coming up to produce the same thing, the same now. Um, and, and if we do this sort of equivalent of that, the, the answer to, sort, to get to the same place is a 10% return. Now, the, the, so the importance of saying that, I mean, this is really sort of very asset specific, but the importance of saying that is that's more relevant to what you're looking at as an investor. Because yes, we have about 0.9% of cost, but ultimately that means that we have 9% of return to investors. And so why we've, we've, we've tried to sort of belabor this point a little bit is that if you went back to that simple model chart at the front and you had 785 million pounds of dividends and you have 653 million pounds of reinvestment, we think that uh, investors look at our stock on a dividend yield basis. But actually the most important thing is to is to look at it on a return basis, i.e. nine percent. So, in other words, what it will be doing, it will be looking at that simple model chart and saying, "Fantastic, seven eighty-five million pounds," and ignoring the six fifty-three. That's obviously bonkers. And so we, 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 you know, we have been talking a lot to investors and saying, you know, this is all about return. The fact that we pay a dividend, um, and we got a one point seven times uh, design dividend cover of three point two last year. That's how we've constructed it, but don't avoid the don't ignore the point seven of reinvestment. Um, hopefully, I've made that sort of point well enough that the return is the most important thing, and therefore we think um, we're probably not trading as we would. We're trading off the dividend yield, not off the return, which we don't think is probably appropriate. And therefore, we think we're underpriced uh, on this sort of basis. Now, what obviously sort of drives this is. Uh, what's happened at the underlying asset level and what this sort of shows is from beginning to end our discount rates have come down as guilt rates have come down but we do believe in the capital asset pricing model because you know people can sort of say well the market's very competitive well wind's not so much as solar wind is a much bigger market and therefore actually there's, there's there isn't necessarily the same level of competition you just need to know where to look um, and therefore it's very hard to ignore cap and cap uh, you know the guilt rates have gone down and up Back to where they were, and so is our discount rate, and that must be right. Um, we know some peers have probably come down to here, then come back to here, and actually, you know, they're not necessarily back to where they need to be going forward, especially with high, higher interest rates coming back into the market. Coming through in terms of what the portfolio looks like, bearing in mind, I think we've got about seven minutes for my half half an hour. So this is the business at the, at the, at the moment we have. Um, five uh, wind farms um, offshore, uh, sorry, six offshore, uh, Walney just off Barrow, and we have three very close to each other, Burbo, you see from, from, from Liverpool, as you can see all these three from Liverpool and North Wales, um, North Hoyle and Rill, so those are um, three quite close. Interesting, what, interesting if you see these, that's a two megawatt machine sitting in here, that's an eight megawatt machine, so four times as big. It's interesting to see them very close together because you don't really get the scale until you do that. Uh, Hornsey One, which is uh, Alan said, uh, biggest wind farm we bought it in the world, uh, now second to Hornsey Two. Um, that's a helicopter ride offshore. And then uh, Humber Gateway, um, which is uh, this one here uh, that we carry in with RWE. And then the rest, you can see the big sort of Scottish uh, uh, contingent. What a surprise. We've got land and wind, um, uh, a fair bit of Northern Ireland. Obviously, the wind, prevailing wind direction comes across the Irish Sea. So that's actually hardly surprising. You can sort of see that in. Uh, in Scotland, and, and then and then a few throughout uh, England, um, through to the south, uh, just near Rye in uh, in Kent. Um, uh, so on time, I'll skip through that. I'm effectively considered the only thing that's sort of interesting, I guess, is the mix of England, Scotland, and also uh, on and offshore, uh, pretty much sort of mixed, if you like, in terms of value. Um, we're independent, so we've bought from 20 different people over the last 10 years. We we, we look at the whole market. Um, and, we, and we've traded. Uh, the most important thing for us, the independence is pretty important because then we look, we, we know that we're not, we haven't got any sort of relationship um, other than lots of relationships, but nothing, you know, no formal relationship we're trying to sell to ourselves or, or anything like that. So independence is, is really, really important. Um, even, even if we ignore the sort of the, the high quality of, of, of a UK board and, and the governance therein. Uh, and then delivering execution credibility. These partners we've had for years, um, you know, we they rely on us doing precisely what we said we wouldn't set time frame. So, you know, extremely important and uh, some very sort of uh, good relationships we've got there. Coming through then, we bought uh, the, the market. If you looked at this slide at the beginning in 2013, that was a 20 billion market, it's now 100. 
we bought one in nine projects we've looked at. So, you know, a good hit rate, but not uh, too much. There's lots of times last year there were 42 wind farms. We bought one, very big, um, but uh, uh, interesting, you know, as, 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 a, as a percentage, I guess, not that high. Um, and these are sort of more the examples, I guess, we bought uh, into Hornsey One. You can sort of see that. Um, we also bought uh, uh, 20 shilling. Why it's not on that number of one on the previous chart is that we committed to doing it a few years ago. It was then built, and when it came, it came into operation, we bought it. Um, and then the same sort of thing, we've made some commitments into projects that uh, are, are going to be delivered shortly. And so most of these will actually be covered just from cash generation that we've got throughout the end of last year, the stuff that was sitting there on balance sheet at the end of the year. Um, and and, and uh, the cash generation we've had coming into this year, which has obviously been significantly enhanced with high gas prices still. Um, coming through, this sort of gives you some sort of feeling. This is the mix of the merchant cash flows and the and the and the, uh, the, the certificate cash flows, if you like. That's what that is. Um, this is it. This is RPI linked. This is uh, uh, this is merchant exposure. So if we take those two together, we have high enough return to. I haven't have a high enough risk from this, but I guess um, to better get high return, but there's a bit stability that we're always, you know, you know, very stable dividend and, and one that can increase with RPI. You can do the same thing by having, you know, new generation merchant projects and new generation mostly offshore projects on a fi on a fixed tariff. But you can combine these to get the same sort of cash flow that then provides, um, you know, the stability but the high enough return to be able to do all the things that we want to do. Um, you look at the market. Uh, you know, it's grown obviously fairly significant in that, and then the offshore, the wind build out. You can sort of see that going forward. And actually, the interesting thing is, at this point in time, you know, all of, all of the government, you saw the sort of government announcements um, uh, first thing this morning. Read that last last night. It was embargoed last night. We saw it this morning. Nothing particularly uh, outrageous in that. It's going into nuclear and various other things. But you know, there's a lot of political will, both from the government and also from the Labour Party. We we saw. Um, Keir Starmer and, and Jonathan Reynolds, the business secretary, throughout the end of last year, I've seen them again actually a few days ago. Jonathan Reynolds, you know, quite sensible actually, and and and, and so the build out between now and 2030 in the in 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 the you know the government's mind um, uh, from 10 gigawatts offshore to 50 gigawatts offshore, that will double that market just in the offshore wind build out that you've got there. Um, and then in terms of you know Keir Starmer's targets, you know, wanting to. Actually, even think about what they might need to do before getting into government, um, given the sort of the high targets that they have for 2030. So this is a market that you know we're a big part of it at the moment, and it will grow enormously over the next 10 years. So uh, um, you know we we, we should play uh, one. It means it won't be that competitive buying assets, hopefully. Um, but uh, you know two, we're 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 capable of making some big investments now, given the size of our balance sheet that Alan alluded to earlier. In terms of ESG, I realise I'm running out of time, but just you know, very quickly, you know, a million homes, tons of CO2 we avoid. We live with livestock. Uh, you can see a picture there of farms. We have some scope scope emissions from TCFD. You can sort of see that we are not Article Nine firm funding enough because that's what we do. It is in our mandate. It's what we do. We buy generating capacity and avoid CO2, etc. So it's pretty straightforward. That um, you can sort of see the amount of money we give into the local community. That's a uh, uh, four million pounds there. Health and safety, obviously, hugely important to, um, for us to make sure that people go home every night. Um, in terms of governance, we're a UK domicile board. You can sort of see that uh, the 60% female representation. Um, we, we, we've got the last of the IPO generation of directors um, finishing at the, uh, um, the, the, the the AGM shortly. We, we, we won't have any of the uh, uh, Scottish mortgage issues um, uh, shown as disappearing, sadly. It's a shame. It's very good. But uh, anyway, it is what it is. Um, and then you can sort of see the the uh, um, sort of develop the, the, the things that we have to report against as SDG in seven and, and five. Right, Alan, I see you coming on the screen, but I'm going to just I'm going to ignore the summary. But I, I want to just do this quickly. So this is ten years of delivery, and 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 hopefully we can we just continue doing this in in this sort of simple, lowest proven way. So the, we've generated a lot of power, and we've, we've avoided a lot of CO two as we've as we've done that versus you know thermal that we've had to be in there otherwise. A lot of cash generation, a lot of dividends paid, but also reinvestment, I guess, is really pretty important. Um, so we continue 10 times to have an RPI increase in the dividend. By design, there's no reason why we just get, don't continue that, you know, for, for, for not ever, whatever it means, but a long, long, long time. Um, we've, we've bought one in nine assets. The NAV has grown 24% above, above the compounded RPI, whether you can sort of see, see the TSR. 
uh, and the market cap has grown up to just just shy of the FTSE 100. So uh, we would we anticipate probably in the next year being in that. Not that it particularly means anything, um, but it uh, um, it gives you some idea of the scale and the meaningful um, nature of the business, and actually the opportunity, as you probably saw on, saw on previous slides, for us to continue growing into that. That is precisely half an hour, Alan. So hopefully that was. I, I appreciate it. I had to rush through the last bit to get within the half an hour, but. Uh, that's a very impressive uh, uh, bit of timing, and also, also, also um, very pleased that you neatly covered the political aspects of potential questions um, just before the end. So, so um, without stepping into uh, into politics, so um, I think there's there's a couple of questions that I'm going to try and relate. Um, so the, the yeah, you know, as you mentioned, that you you want to own assets forever, um, and and it'd be interesting to sort of come at it from a slightly different angle and and think about the the assets themselves in terms of their service life and and what what you what you need to do and what you can do to maintain and improve them. And also, yeah, yeah, you, you know, it's your tenth anniversary, isn't it? So perhaps a little bit on improvements in technology since since you uh, came to market. And and there, there's a there's a question which uh, you know this is a bit of a stretch to relate it, but it's a but it, this is a phenomenon, isn't it? About low wind, low wind, you know, wind, you know, global wind speeds are supposedly reducing, um, ironically, as a consequence of global warming so so how how do how do assets to you know how efficient are assets today compared to assets that are 10 or, or 15 years old and and how might that help mitigate issues like that if indeed issues like that really matter okay you give about seven ten questions there i'll, I'll try I know. I'm, tr I'm trying to be efficient <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so i think i've got them if, if, if i don't answer them forgive me all of them um it's not because i'm trying i'm not trying to answer them i think i mean it's interesting politically i think that you know um 10 years ago uh you know the, the, the conservative government you know we got over the line because we had a liberal democrat uh, business secretary vince cable and he was very helpful and, and sensibly so you know, the conservatives to some extent had to get over themselves you then go forward for four, four or five years um you know just completely different political environment uh, both sides it's just not the point um and and scotland is even more green if you like um so i think all the all these things so the, you know the scottish independence would be largely relevant to us etc but i think all of that sort of moved just tremendously um in terms of um engineering so we we, we would expect to, i mean Inside Green Coat Capital, which is slightly different, I guess, so Australia's Green Coat now, we have um, in our team, uh, we have seven engineers that runs this business of about 18. We have um, seven engineers who look at all our, all our sites all the time and go and see them quite often. And then we have obviously maintenance, maintenance on, on site as well. But, you know, we are, we're not a financial investor in that sense. We do, we, we, you know, the leadership team of a big PLC that runs wind assets, and we've got a, a big engineering base on that. Um, in terms of you know asset life, we'd expect them to last. Uh, you know, we assume in our model they, that they they ask that they 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 operate for thirty years and then they don't exist uh, and they're taken down. That's obviously not going to happen. They're going to continue operating, but because the discount rate for the the merchant cash flows is ten percent, by the time you get you know even if we think they're forty years, you, you don't add an awful lot to nav by putting uh, even if you wanted to do it uh, you know npv of you know 30 to 40 or whatever which we you, you probably expect um the interesting things in 10 years actually is, is is not necessarily that turbines behave differently but but actually uh the way that people manage in the logistics management the spare parts management or you know, especially offshore the fact you do condition monitoring so you can get uh you know there's going to be a failure before it happens because you can hear it um, I think there's a whole lot of logistics is just done much better. Um, the one thing actually is interesting in terms of having having high availability that we're sort of debating about is in this part here in the Highlands, um, are we ex are we experiencing sort of slightly lower availabilities getting getting the engineering cap capability out of the central belt and into the Highlands? Is it there? 
And so, you know, some of our assets in the north, we wor worry a little bit about, you know, they're, they're, they're just a couple of percent off, you know, instead of being 97% available, available, they may be 95 or something. But is, is there something we need to address with the Scottish Government, with SSC, with Scottish Power, et cetera, to be able to sort of address that point? There might, there might be, actually. Um, I mean, this is very much in the margins, but you know, those are the things that we'll sort of think about. Um, so in 10 years, we've, we've had problems all over the place. But yeah, you would. You've got generating. You've got generating kit. So you know we have um, issues with leading edge, leading edge corrosion on some of the blades. That's fine. You can fix it. We've had you know blade bolt issues. We've had um, gearboxes that need changing. Well, fine because but we have a budget to do that. So you know, this is why we have a team of engineers to do that. So it, it's nothing that catches us off guard. We've got a very experienced team, um, uh, and 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 uh, you know it's sort of very well capable of doing that. Now. Um, so hopefully that you know there are things that you can do to add a little bit of efficiency in terms of you know working out that the blades are turned perfectly into wind um, because obviously when you get wind through a turbine it distorts there's a bit of turbulence and it distorts because you measure the direction of the back um, and so can you do it can you can you measure the actual direction not what you think you're reading um, so that you know then that, that sort of probably adds about a one percent onto the onto the turbine production so there there are things that you can do like that. But generally, you want your turbines to deliver precisely what you expect. Um, and so, you know, have we modeled properly? Have we got the, have we got the right maintenance budget in, in there, et cetera? Now, um, I think the third point you were talking about was low wind potentially. I don't think there's, I don't think there's necessarily global low wind. I think there's a debate, um, and you've obviously uh, concluded one side of it, uh, and, and I would argue actually it's the wrong way of looking at it. Um, I think there's a debate that in the UK uh, that if the polar cap um, becomes warmer, that does that mean the temperature differential between the UK and the polars uh, uh, becomes lower and therefore is the wind lower? That's one thought. The other thought um, is that if you have more power in the weather because it's hotter, which you'd expect, you know, because of thermodynamics, etc., you'd, you'd expect that to be the case, then you could argue that the um, that the, the wind should be stronger uh, as temperature goes up. So I think it's it's and some scientists think one, some type scientists think the other. I think the sort of simple simple thing is that any effect you might see on our wind production is statistical. It's not it's not really climate related at this point. You might see those effects over 25, 30 years, but given we're only assuming a 30 year asset life, it really wouldn't affect this business very much at all. In, in, in terms of investment at this point. Um, in 30 years time, it may be more of an effect, but you know, we'll find out whether it's up or down. We don't really know at this point. So I wouldn't conclude too much about you know, reading anything about as, as, as UK wind uh, speed gone down, not statistically relevantly, no. Did I answer all your questions? I think I tried to go through most of them. You, you did a good job, yeah. Yeah, thanks, that's, that's great. There's another um, couple of questions that really relate to um you know we uk wind has a has a very focused um investment strategy yeah um, there's a couple of questions kind of contrasting that with with other strategies in your in your listed peers um yeah. you know and a question about things like interconnectors and yeah. energy store you know all energy storage all of these are kind of allied yeah sectors um and and um so uh, you know they're all in they're all investable and okay. so so I, I, i'm not sure that the question is should uk wind be um I'll tell you doing what all of these other, the doing all, doing, <laughs> i think because i because i think i know what the answer is but, but, no, no, but, no, but it's let me give you a feel for that, Adam. I, I think that, I mean, we, we were clear, actually. I mean, we, get, we gave ourselves no scope for changing what we do because we put it in the title. Um, but we, we sort of thought, actually, early doors that, you know, one, the UK wind market is a massive market. So, you know, we will have the expert team for that. If, if obviously, then, you know, solar and mix and whatever have come on top of that. We think generally people have, if they've, and it's why independence is relevant. So I think people have basically put, they had projects in associated vehicles and what can we do to sell them and we'll make it like this whereas we had a blank piece of paper what what do we think the market needs and and therefore we go we went to win because we thought that was the biggest most you know less least competitive etc and just much bigger opportunity so that's why we focused that we also thought currency risk um was potentially significant versus say vol wind volume risk um 
and and therefore you know we as what was green Coat capital uh, instead of trying to change the geography or change what went into the business we we just listed two companies so green Coat renewables is a sort of similar euro version so that's what that's how you say so if you want to buy euro assets buy both companies for instance but also we would say you know if you want the expert team for solar projects well there are solar businesses so go buy some of that um different risk profile um i, I could give you comment about that but it wouldn't be wouldn't be appropriate but i think we want to just be the wind experts and i think we, we've done that really well now in terms of store things you know more sort of ancillary stuff storage i i Storage always feels to us, um, as, as it, it, it's a bit like sort of uh, transmission. It's almost, it almost feels as if the, the way really to fix the problems that the country has on a wider scale is to have storage on an industrial scale, not at the site level. And therefore, actually, the build out of hydrogen electrolysis is pretty important. Lithium batteries won't solve this, co this country's problems of intermittency. Hydrogen electrolysis just might. Um, so, you know, we think storage is a good thing, but at a different type of storage, at a different scale, you know, the whole system set up where transmissions, I mean, a lot, lot of the, a lot of the wind build out we're getting here, the 40, 10 to 50 gigawatts is not in the south of England where it's needed. It's way up here. And so how do you get the power south? Well, you know, do you put big cables down the country? So you need to, the government needs to sort that transmission over the next few years as well. But also, uh, it, you may you may cope with not quite so much transmission down the country if you then start putting hydrogen all the way up the country as well. And how does that work into the, you know, the vehicle system? Is it all EVs or is it hydrogen vehicles? Is it, you know, how does that work into transport? There's, this is going to be a fascinating 10, 15 years going forward, 20 years of how the country basically revolutionizes itself into a, you know, a carbon free uh, new era. It'll be absolutely fascinating how it's done. Um, we don't think lithium batteries are particularly that significant in terms of that overall change. I bet you expected me to answer it like that. Well, as you say, you've uh, coded it into the into the name, both the yeah. geography and the asset class. So yeah, it's it's very clear. And as you say, you've also got a sister sister vehicle that provides some of that that different yeah. jurisdiction and asset. So. So um, everyone knows where to look for that. So, so then, I mean, uh, there ha there have been quite a few questions about the politics, which I think you have, I think you've dealt with. But I suppose yeah. this 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 uh, this other issue is 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 kind of global competition, isn't it? Yeah. And and you've just mentioned all of the ancillary challenges that the UK has, engineering challenges yeah. the UK has, and and. Um, yeah, other other governments yeah. are throw, throwing huge amounts of money at the problem, and and you know there's there are practical issues about you know we have we have a we have a leading industry, yeah. Um, but but how do how do we retain how do we retain the expertise and how do we re retain that lead and and so without without trying to sort of get into a debate about which government might come in next you know what what's on your wish list of things the uk could do to 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 yeah keep, keep what it has against you know the you know the us is enormous investment and the yeah. eu no, it's, had it's, to do the same it's interesting there i was at an event last night where uh, lord john brown of xbp uh, which was uh, he had to get over the fact that he used to be chief executive of pp um, yeah but he seems to be, he's chairman of something called uh, Beyond Net Zero. I think, yeah, but it was a bit, a bit before Net Zero for you, John, wasn't it? Uh, sorry, joking aside, he was very, he was interesting. But uh, he, he was talking about the, the need of $4 trillion every year, an unbelievable amount of money. Um, uh, so that's just in one sense a global, uh, global context. Um, I, th I think for us, it, it, rather strangely in some ways, I mean, it, what we're really talking about, because we're obviously buying operating assets, you know, there isn't really that much relevance to us. You know, what, what there is, a, there is a really good, uh, there's a really significant answer for the can, the world and the and 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 the, and the UK, in the sense that if the government wants, and I was talking to RWE last night, who was sort of building, and and, and they're getting approved for new projects. You maybe only saw the Times a few weeks ago. You know, Hornsey Three. You know, the next biggest project in the world. Um, debating about whether it was actually going to ever get built because the CFD level was set 
um, before you know movements in interest rates. So the cost of capital has gone up it, it, because of interest rates predominantly, maybe because of less trust a little bit, but mostly because of interest rates. And so you've got into a world where you know maybe even as well, you know, the, the, there's such need for supply of turbines. The turbine contract prices have gone up. You know, can these projects? And the, but the CFDs are set for when they were when the world was different. So actually, will those projects get built out? That's a really interesting question. So I think that the you know the, the thing I said to Chris Starmer before Christmas is, um, you know, the one thing that the investment community want is stability. We just need to know that you know we we invest and the return is what we expect. We can't because if you start not doing that, then then the cost of capital goes up because you need to put risk premium into into, into that. And actually, what we're not meant to be a high we're meant to be a low risk business. We're meant to be putting assets onto the business that we're going to run for life, and we know that what they're going to deliver. Um, and, 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 and therefore, you know, the, 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 you need to be very careful how you, um, uh, you know, what you do in terms of in terms of, 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 of regulation and, and changes, and, and even, you know, windfall taxes, which is obviously what happened in, in, in some form. Yes, last year, we I, I said to the chancellor before Christmas, said that the, the problem to some extent is that the the, the, the narrative in last summer was all about Ukraine. When you actually did it, it then became about power prices. Having been high, I said the, diff the the narrative is the problem. It's not that what's happened actually is a big deal. It's that people think that um, you know there is political risk again, and 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 actually it was it was an interesting answer because I think that what you got back was that the 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 the, 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 the significance last year was so extreme that they had to do something. Um, but even though every single conversation we had with government ministers throughout the back end of last year, getting into this year was. We need to build out what we need to build out, but I need to, I need to stand up and move around. I've been sitting here for too long. Uh, anyway, you can see me. Sorry, there you go. Um, so, so I think the you know the political need was is it, still there, but uh, uh, but you know we had obviously a, you know, it's an issue through last year. So I think that that you know the the the, the windfall tax is a thing. It's it's not really relevant to us much going forward, but it. That's the sort of worry is the you know if government starts doing stuff like that, then people will start to think it becomes you know there's political risk there. I don't think there actually is. Um, I think it's just more you know more because we had a very weird world driven mostly by Ukraine, and and uh, you know we got through to the beginning of this year. It's much, everything's much more stable again, and we can hopefully just march forward and continue doing what we're doing without that sort of type of distraction. So I've, I've been waffling, so I better stop. That's um, excellent timing. Actually, I think we've covered. I think we've covered quite a bit of ground, and and I've tried to ask um, um, at least partially all of the questions um, that have come in. But obviously, if anyone has any burning questions, um, you know how to drop us a line, and um, we may be able to answer that. And obviously, there's yeah. plenty of information on both Kepler's website and uh, and indeed on the company's website as well there's pl there's plenty to get your teeth into so um so i'd encourage you to look at both of both of those um stephen thanks so much uh, thanks, thanks, thanks so much for your time thank you Adam. thank you everyone for joining Hopefully that was interesting and, and i'm absolutely very happy to answer any of the questions if you send them through and we can uh, we can work out the answers well not work out the answers we know the answers i will tell you <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Excellent. Thank you. On that on that note. Thanks everyone. Cheers.